Well, hello from PBL World <laughs> again. I'm here, uh, lucky to be here with Sam Seidel and Emily Peloton. And we are going to, uh, they've both been keynoters this week at, at <coughs> PBL World. And did you two know each other? Um, have you met face to face before this week? No. Nope. Great, great. Well, your messages um, are so complimentary and um, uh, you know, have so much in common. But I think we're going to dig in a little bit today on some, um, maybe some places where you go in different directions in education. And you both bring really different perspectives. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this whole field of design and design thinking and where that fits in education and problem solving. And Emily, you're bringing the architect's lens, way of looking at the world. And Sam, you're coming from a background in education and pop culture. So coming from different places into the world of education. Emily, do you want to talk about uh, the difference between design and design thinking and how those big ideas kind of connect with education. Yeah, so, well, what Sue is making reference to is, uh, so a couple years ago we talked and I've always had like kind of a visceral, like icky feeling about the term design thinking and not, not because of the concept of it, it's more that um, I went to six years of design and architecture school and no one ever used, like, they don't teach you design thinking as a process. If anything, they tell you there is no process. And the process is there is no process. And every project is going to dictate something different. And so I think my, my question about design thinking is whether you can really make creativity a recipe. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know that, to, yeah, to me there's, there's so much that I see my students doing that are, decisions they make in the moment um, that are brilliant, that if I had prescribed a design thinking process, they may not have gotten there. So it's more just like I, I don't love that kind of structure within creativity, because I think the most amazing things come out of like just rigor in the moment. So it, it's more the terminology and that like I never learned that, and if anything, I was taught the opposite. So, having said that, <laughs> Sam, I know you're using design thinking effectively in Providence to really um, tackle some tough real-world issues with students and with teachers, and it seems to be a process that's working well. I wonder if you want to talk about how it does work well and, and kind of what the terms mean. Sure. I mean, I think the piece that um, resonates most deeply for me um, is human-centered design. And I think part of what I talked with you about yesterday in our last Google Hangouts, you think, <laughs> was um, the important, like, I think one of the things that we've structured, and I think your point about structuring creativity is a good one, Emily, but I think one of the things that we've been able to use design thinking to structure in is making sure that before people start jumping to conclusions, they're doing the kind of exploration, the, first of all, the homework of thinking, again, rigorously about who is actually, who is this, this thing that I'm creating intended for, and then trying to understand that person or group of people's experience, and then do some exploration and research in the world, not necessarily like book research or online research, although I can include that, but real research of observation, of shadowing folks, of talking with them directly, um, to learn before jumping to conclusions and solutions. Um, and there's other pieces of it, but for me that's one of the pieces that's really important. And Susie, you mentioned you know, my background in education and hip-hop culture, but I also learn a lot from social justice work and social justice movements. And one of my deep beliefs is that people most affected by a problem, an issue, et cetera, should be involved in fixing or solving that issue. And I don't think that's inherent in all design thinking processes by any stretch, but I think when we talk about human-centered design, it kind of is. Ideally, I think the, you know, the people most affected by an issue or a challenge that's being taken on should be involved in the actual design process. But even if they're not, they should at least their experience should really be listened to and thought about. And that's one of the pieces that I don't think is intuitive to a lot of people who are out in the world trying to develop projects, trying to solve major problems, and that I do think um, human-centered design thinking um, really ensures is at the center of the conversation. It always comes back to the user's experience. So, you know, like I run the education programs from the Business Innovation Factory. We call it the Student Experience Lab rather than the Education Lab. And for me, that's a piece of, yeah, there's, there's a cognitive... You know, I mean, it's a rhetorical difference that signals a bigger difference. Right. I mean, language matters. Yeah. Well, I think so. <laughs> right as an English teacher. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so from the kind of the different places you're starting from, and maybe slightly different ways you're approaching problem solving, it seems as though you both get students into situations where they're connecting with people that they might not connect with otherwise. 
So just in your keynote this morning, Emily, you were sharing um, a clip of your students presenting their visual um, models or ideas for farmers market to people in Birdie County that they might not have talked with otherwise. Sam, I'm guessing the students you work with are out interviewing people, observing people that you might not necessarily connect to. So I guess I'm curious for both of you, as you bring this kind of design mind to problem solving into PDL, how do you help kind of open up the world for your students and get them to go outside the normal kind of boundaries of school and, and bring those ideas also into what we think of the school and make those conversations you know, really fruitful? Yeah, so I feel like I should rescind my previous answer because I think that just really quickly, the way that you describe design thinking makes total sense to me. And so it, the question about how do you get students to go out into the world and be uncomfortable and talk to the mayor or whatever, exactly. I think is a natural reflex once they've done that. So if, if I now think about design thinking as a human-centered research project process, um, I think the next natural step, once you've gone through that as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, whatever, is, okay, well, now how do I do it? So if I've come up with this great idea, and design thinking really is more about the, the generation of ideas and not, not necessarily the execution of it. But if you've done that process well, I think the natural next step you're going to want to take is now who do I have to talk to to get this done? Mm -hmm. And often, if they are good solutions that are connected to context and people and needs, then you are going to have to go outside the classroom because it's always going to involve people that can bring resources that you don't have. Um, so that is one, I, I like your answer a lot. I mean, I think that the human centered piece of it is so is so crucial and it demands conversations mm -hmm. with people that, that you might not otherwise talk to. Design in the traditional sense, like of the craftsman in the studio, like making a lamp or whatever, you can do that in total isolation. If you want to build a farmer's market, you need like the way in of 200 other people. Mm -hmm. So those are the projects that are really exciting to me and it's less about forcing students into those conversations so much as they get there on their own and they realize they have to have different stakeholders in order to pull off the thing that they believe in. Right, right. I mean, to not answer your question at all, Susie, and just continue the conversation <laughs> sure. we already started. Um, <laughs> off we go. You know, I, I, I also really appreciate what you were saying about kind of being careful about orthodoxy to this like set of really strict steps yeah. or rules or anything else, especially when you're championing creativity, right? It's kind of ironic that we're like, we just want everyone to be so creative that we're going to tell you exactly what you have to do each step of the way. Um, and I think a lot of these things are tools. I mean, there is like some very clear steps in the design thinking mm -hmm. that we've built into some of our projects. Um, my hope is that those are tools that people use as they are useful. I mean, it's like protocols, which, in, you know, in education work, and, you know, I was trained in this thing, the National School of Foreign Faculties. Mm -hmm. um, Critical friends sure, groups. Sure, which we use in PDL endlessly. And it's great, but when if you've ever seen somebody get really like militant about it and not have a sensitivity to a group, it's not great. I mean, they're just they're good tools that people can pull on. And I think that the danger with any of these things, whether it's the eight essentials of project based learning, the three, four, five, six steps of design thinking that different folks mm -hmm. have, you know, different organizations have laid out, the um, you know, these protocols with um, NSRF. You have to be careful once you set those things up that people don't take it too literally. And it's one of the reasons I've always resisted doing like a how-to book around hip hop and education mm -hmm. or like putting out kind of curriculum because mm -hmm. the whole point is I want people to sample, to remix, to mm -hmm. be constantly doing new things. And I, you know, there is this risk anytime you start to really structure out a process. And I think that's part of what you were getting at, which I think is a really important critique and thing that we need to remember as we say, yes, this is great and it can open up all these ideas and open up all these doors and mm -hmm. be a great bridge to creativity. If you're not careful, it can also shut down some of those things. Right, right. So. And that design thinking or any process, I mean, creativity to me is never, you're never done being creative. Like, you can always, you might finish a project and then think, like, oh, wait, I had another draft or I had another version. And so I also don't, the design thinking process, I also hope people don't see the end of the design thinking process as the end of a project. Often it's the beginning. It's like you get there and then your mind is blown mm -hmm. and then there's nothing telling you what to do after that. So... That, to me, that's the most amazing moment for students is when they have to decide, like, I have this idea, and now what? Now, is, now it's going to get hard. Now the rubber hits the road, and I have all these constraints to pull it off. Yeah. So I, 
I wish there was like a design thinking part too. Like, how do you actually get the thing done? Like, that's well, where all the work in the is. in the design thing. No, no, no. That in, <laughs> in the design thinking process that um, my colleagues at BIT have designed, um, the last few stages are about. For prototyping, testing that out, mm -hmm. and then actually building something and putting it into the world and you know, iterating on that. So we have built it into that process, um, and I think yeah, I think it's really limited if you don't get to play yeah. in that way in the real world and actually try to take it out there and transform and see if it works the way that you've imagined right. and you know done all this rigorous research to make sure that it will. Um, but inevitably, you're going to learn a lot in that process. Um, and we did see with our teachers design for education process, a lot of teachers, so the first step is about defining your design challenge. Mm -hmm. Many teachers went back in the later, last stages and actually realized that they wanted to rewrite their design challenge. I mean, so it did, in a sense, yeah. loop sure. back to being yeah. like, oh, actually, this, there's this bigger problem we're just going right. to solve it. Yeah. Exactly. And I think as you were just talking about where what comes out of the process, I think maybe that's kind of our last topic today is, you know, what is the end result? Like, yours very much about built things, tangible, part of the built environment. Um, that comment you shared today about the student wanting to bring these kids back someday and say, we built that. It's just, it's a wonderful thing. And what's coming out of the process you're building might be a physical thing, but it might be a new way for teachers to think about professional development. So there are different kinds of um, results that emerge. But you know, can you just talk about the difference between something built, something more of a process? Um, how do you kind of make those live on beyond, okay, we're done with this project, and now what's left? What do we, what do we have to remind us of what we did together? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm a sucker for an architectural artifact. <laughs> but um, I had a really tough moment last year where we built, my students built a Container a, a classroom out of shipping containers. I remember, it's wild. And then, and they were so proud of it. And then, long story made short, the district made us move it. Mm -hmm. And so we had to disassemble it and move it. And I was so mad and like, oh, I just wanted anyway. But we learned, the students and I learned this really important lesson about impermanence. And you might build something and it might get torn down. And so then, that that is the question. Then what's left? Mm -hmm. And obviously, the memory of building it and the things that we learned together. But for my students, it was um, when the building was gone, it was they still had the same sense of confidence, like, OK, fine, we'll build something else. So it was like confidence, but also a little bit of like a positive chip on your shoulder, like, OK, I can do it better next time. So uh, whether that's a classroom or a library or whatever, I, I think the, and that's probably the same thing for design thinking and how teachers respond to that as a process for the first time. That, it's just a change in mentality. Mm -hmm. Like I, everything I've been doing, I can do differently, and I can do it better. And that's, to me, that's the only thing about design that matters. Is just going through your life realizing that everything can be better, and that mm -hmm. you can affect it, and mm -hmm. and you have no excuse, um, but to just go and fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and with you know the some of the um, examples you shared yesterday of, of projects that teachers have taken on, mm -hmm. they're clearly outcomes, but they're not physical things. But right. can you talk about kind of how those outcomes kind of live on after the process ends. Well, one of the pieces that we encourage through the process is thinking about storytelling mm -hmm. and thinking about whether, you know, and I think this is especially relevant when you don't have a physical, tangible right. you know, building or object, yeah. um, is creating, you know, storytelling assets of mm -hmm. various sorts. It could be video and multimedia, you know, it could be online, of mm -hmm. course. Um, it can be physical books and documentation. Um, but I think that in a lot of cases, the story becomes a really important piece for a number of reasons. Um, partially because it lifts the hood and lets people see what the thinking, you know, what everything that went into it. Um, and also because one of the important outcomes is the process. And I, I tried to get at that yesterday. I mean, part of it is that um, teachers or students or anybody else may design some really powerful, amazing things that have utility in the world, sometimes just in their area and sometimes in a much bigger way. Um, so there's the product in that sense of what they've designed, which may or may not be physical, but you know it's the result of the process. Mm -hmm. And then there's the process and what that has meant for the people who have participated, mm -hmm. and has it created those kind of sensibilities of looking at the world in a different way and always asking questions about how something could be you know, designed better and having some of those you know, exercise your creative muscles in these different ways. Um, and that those pieces are products in a sense too. I mean, it's mm -hmm. the process, but it's it's the change that it's made in people's lives who participated, whether the thing that they develop lives on mm -hmm. or gets moved somewhere else, or the process that the teachers created gets subsumed in some way by the district and things change. You know, any of that can happen. 
but they, you know, if they've had a change, mm -hmm. that is another product. And so I think for both, um, again, especially on non-physical mm -hmm. projects, um, and I'm always jealous of the really physical ones because I'm like, it's so clear, like right. that wasn't there, and now it's there. Exactly. Um, but when you know, when you don't have that, I think that the storytelling work becomes especially important. Right, which seems like maybe a lesson for um, PBL teachers to consider. Like, you know, what what lives on when students are done with this project? Well, it's, it's one of the reasons I'm so or always so impressed, inspired, moved by the work of Reggio Emilia preschools because how, if you've seen their mm -hmm. stuff, I mean, the documentation that they do of process is does that first mm -hmm. of all, and it's just so respectful as of students as thinkers uh -huh. um, and intellects that it really pushes the way people think. Sure. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think that we should absolutely be doing more of that in PBL classrooms in general. Right, right. So any, um, you know, what would be great for to keep you guys together working on a new project and see what you could come up with, you know, come up with with your kind of wild ideas <laughs> in one space. So that might be for a future, future activity. Like but it. Just any final, you know, words of wisdom for the PBL world um, audience who's here, and you know, really, they're just doing the hard design work now of imagining what that great project could be. They are architecting, you know, future student learning experiences. Um, so, any any wisdom for them as they go through this process and prepare to take it out in the world? <laughs> I'm still thinking. <laughs> I mean, I think one piece, you know, I, I, one of the things I, I was really impressed by your keynote and it is inspiring, and it, I think it can also be intimidating, right, if I'm somebody who's never picked, in the same way that when I talk about hip-hop, people are like, I've never rapped or made a beat, like, I don't know, you know, and, you know, it's the same, like, I've never picked up a, a circular saw or, you know, I don't have a degree in architecture, and I think, like, one of the big takeaways um, that I would encourage is, you know, it's just for people to feel like, first of all, everyone has that thing for themselves, so figuring out what that is and sharing it, but also that it's like it's really okay to start small. You don't necessarily need the CNC router, the yeah. 3D printer, the you know. I mean that stuff is cool, but mm -hmm. um, there are ways to build you know physically some some much more you know, mo start in a much more modest way, sure. um, and that it's really doable. You know, I just don't want anybody to feel like oh I can't do that because I don't have X tool or sure. X degree. I think that the sensibilities that Emily was talking about and the sensibilities that I. You know, was talking about yesterday are things that anybody can take and use, um, and then you just have to start doing it. But I, I just don't want anybody to feel like because they don't have a particular item or thing in their background that that yeah. means yeah. they can't be doing that. I, re I, re I really don't think that's true, and I've seen people do maybe not as like visually spectacular, mm -hmm. um, but some really powerful oh, yeah. design build stuff without an architecture background or without those tools, sure. right? So. Sure. You know, just start it up, and then, and then the stuff starts coming to you. Right there. Yeah, yeah. And to tie it back to your original question uh -huh. about design thinking and my aversion to it, I mean, it, <laughs> you know, it's it's more just a critique. And I think what you said is dead on. Like, just because I have an architecture degree and whatever, like, if design thinking is your way to to put one toe in the water and and just like open up your mind to, as a teacher to like, oh well, I, this unit I've been teaching the same way for ten years. There's another way to do it, or ten ways to do it. Like that, that is the amazing thing to me about design thinking is that it, it, it is for so many people. I've talked to so many teachers that are like, I didn't even know that existed, and now I'm rethinking everything. So that's, I mean, you don't need to go to architecture school to know that. And so I, I do love the idea that um, of access. That it's not about mm -hmm. like the building that students built that's an architectural record. Like if you make a pencil box and your kids enjoy it, and you rewrite four unit plans in the process. Like that's a really beautiful thing. And yeah, and a few things about that. One is your students will probably push that to the next level very quickly, um, and so you don't always have to. I mean, you yeah. can start with something pretty modest, and like you know, they'll just start. They'll take it there it. for you. Yeah. Um, and also, like I, I would also just on top of that, encourage folks to reach out to the people in your community. Like, don't assume that the CEO of this company wouldn't invite your students in. As you don't, shared it. Don't assume that you're not an architect, right, yeah. that you couldn't get either an architect to come in or you know that you could bring students to an architecture firm. I think um, you know, being ambitious and making those asks is another thing. What the, what the worst that can happen is they say no. Right. Um, and that's actually a good thing. We should be getting some no's. That means we're being ambitious, right? So. And audacious. Yes. <laughs> for, for this morning, which yeah. is a great closing. Great. Well, thank you both for sharing more of your thoughts. And, Thanks for um, getting us together. Yeah, and just 
great to hear you guys bounce ideas off each other. So, yeah, um, but <laughs> no fights. It was very we'll save that for off camera. <laughs> <laughs> great. Okay. Um, so we're gonna keep conversations going on Twitter. If folks um, have more follow up questions, tweet them to us, and and we'll uh, keep the dialogue going. Thanks. Thank you.